Hey, happy Friday. This week, Huawei announced their first ever 5 nanometer chips. Intel launched their 14th generation laptop chips. Google lost in court versus Epic. And the European Union announced their AI Act. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. This video was sponsored by GiveWell, which helps you pick the best charities to donate to. Okay, we'll start the brief with Threads, the Twitter clone of Mark Zuckerberg, aka the second most hated social media mogul. The social network has finally launched in Europe yesterday, after launching pretty much everywhere else back in July. And right before that, Zuck also announced that they started a test where posts from Threads accounts will be available on Mastodon and other services that use the ActivityPub protocol. And indeed, the first users are reporting that they can already see posts from Instagram chief Adam Mosseri on a Mastodon on already. That's low-key pretty exciting in my opinion. Interoperable social media networks. Kind of crazy. And if you'd like me to make a whole video about how ActivityPub and Federation works, let me know down in the comments. Moving on in sad news for gamers, the game conference E3 is now officially dead as all the big game companies move to hosting their own events instead of wanting to share one. And meanwhile, in good news for Samsung, the company now aims to sell over 35 million Galaxy S24 series phones or a full 10 million or 40% more than the Galaxy S23 series. This means they are very confident in their upcoming flagship that should launch in January already. And finally for the brief, Tesla unveiled Optimus Gen 2, its upgraded humanoid robot prototype that is 30% faster, 10 kilos lighter, and has sensors on all of its fingers. And the company was also this week forced to recall almost every Tesla sold in the United States. In practice, this basically just means that they'll have to push a software updates to all the vehicles due to insufficient safety protocols around autopilot, and experts argue that more restrictions might come to Teslas later as well. Okay, and for my first story of the week, we have to talk about Huawei's new chip. Specifically, the company launched the Kirin 9006C in China, which is their first ever 5 nanometer ARM chip, presumably made in China, despite all of the US sanctions. This is now shipping in a single laptop called the Qingyun L540, which is running Linux and is sold exclusively to enterprise and government agencies in China, but wow, that's a massive milestone. We previously thought that anything smaller than 7 nanometers would be extremely difficult to pull off with China's existing chip making equipment, so this is either a small batch of very specialized chips, or Huawei actually got significantly better at making chips than we thought. It is important that nobody from the media has actually tested these chips yet, at least as far as I know. It is just something that Huawei has announced, and we don't actually know how many Huawei can make of these either, even if the laptop seems to be up for sale for a pretty reasonable sub $1,000 price tag, at least for select customers now. Also, Taiwan's TSMC is already talking about 2 nanometer chips by 2025, so the race does not stop where it is now. But either way, Huawei is definitely onto something with their chips lately. And talking of laptop chips, my second story of the week is Intel finally properly launching their 14th generation Meteor Lake mobile processors for laptops that actually came with some pretty big surprises. On the disappointing side, the CPU only seems to have made fairly modest improvements over last year's Intel processors, but on the impressive side, the company's Intel Arc GPUs are actually close to twice as powerful as last year's tank, with early benchmarks claiming that they can now beat AMD's very good laptop offerings, like the 780M that powers gaming handhelds for example. So we can finally get decent gaming and GPU performance on thin and light Intel chips too. Meanwhile, power efficiency improvements are actually really confusing. Intel itself claims that they made really big improvements, while tests from YouTubers are all over the place. Hardware Canucks claims that their model saw massive gains with up to 20 plus hours of battery life in light tasks. Dave2D shows a big jump as well, almost doubling over last gen in many workloads, while many others, like Jared's tech, basically claim that things are more or less the same as last year, or maybe even slightly worse. I think these differences come from various reviewers having different early samples, and also from the fact that Intel now has multiple clusters of the processor that do or do not light up, depending on what workloads you run, so you will probably get wildly different efficiency characteristics depending on what tests you run. So in short, we got potentially big efficiency improvements, definitely big GPU improvements, and practically irrelevant CPU improvements. 
And meanwhile, on top of these, there's also now a proper NPU to help with AI workloads too. And here, Intel's most interesting claim is that they actually expect to sell 100 million chips with their NPUs included within the next two years. So they expect NPUs to quickly become an industry standard and for developers to optimize their apps for Intel's tech in particular. So overall, this is definitely a big step into the right direction, but perhaps not quite the complete victory lap that Intel and many others were hoping for. Still pretty good. Okay, and for my third story of the week, the European Union finally rolled out their first real attempt at legislating AI a couple of days ago. It's called the AI Act, and it is actually an outline for now, which means there's still going to be a whole lot of debate before it becomes final. All of this follows President Biden's executive order from not long ago, although the EU already has more concrete proposals in place already, including the attempt to group AI applications into one of four risk levels, each of which could result in different rules. Minimal risk risk AI would practically not be regulated at all. Limited risk applications would only require disclosure. For example, an AI chatbot would have to declare that you are in fact interacting with AI. High risk, which could include those where AI deals with critical infrastructure or medical devices, or where it evaluates a consumer's creditworthiness, for example, well, those would have to follow a set of rules like using high quality datasets, logging of activity, having human oversight, etc. And finally, AI with unacceptable risks would be banned altogether, which, for example, includes social scoring systems by governments or companies, biometric systems like emotion recognition systems used at a workplace, or real time biometric identification for law enforcement purposes in publicly accessible spaces. And beside these four characteristics, the AI Act also says that any model that is trained using a total compute power of more than 10 to the power of 25 flops is considered to automatically carry systemic risks, and this would cover large current models like GPT-4. They say they will update these limits with time, and I actually have no idea how they plan to accurately classify AI into various risk categories or how they plan to enforce their rules once these AIs are made, for example, open source. But either way, we should keep an eye on these rules. Okay, and for my fourth bonus story of the week, Google actually lost in court to Epic this week, and they did so in a pretty spectacular manner. So this week, the jury found that Google's Android App Store monopoly does indeed violate antitrust law, and next month, the judge will decide how exactly to remedy Google's anti-competitive monopoly power. Epic did not ask for monetary damages in the trial, but instead asked all developers to be able to introduce their own Android app stores and to use their own billing systems on Android devices without restrictions. We'll see what happens, and of course Google will appeal, but that would fundamentally change Google's business model with Android. Now remember that Epic basically lost this same case against Apple not long ago, where the courts ruled that Apple enforcing an app store and payment monopoly on their platform was actually okay. And there are a few reasons for this, but two main ones really stood out to me. First is that unlike Apple, Google employees actually wrote down explicitly how they were paying off various parties to stop them from launching competing app stores or to stop them from bringing their apps to competing app stores. There was so much explicit evidence that Google executives, including Sundar Pichai himself, actually just went oops and let vital evidence auto-delete itself from chats, which was confirmed to be one of the biggest factors even for the jury for the ruling, and the judge called it, quote, the most serious and disturbing evidence I have ever seen in my decade on the bench with respect to a party intentionally suppressing relevant evidence. Ouch. But second, it's ironically Google's much more open and much less strict ecosystem that actually forced them or at least incentivized them to create these really explicit and shady deals on their platform when Apple didn't have to do the same. Google, I guess, felt like they had to pay off companies to stop them from competing because they actually allow competition on Android in the first place in the form of, for example, alternative app stores. Meanwhile, Apple, who completely owns its own walled garden and outright blocks alternatives, didn't have to make any explicitly shady deals, so they didn't get caught red-handed. And that is pretty wild. All right, the holiday season is on us, and if you, like me, have been thinking about some charitable endeavors, but you've been struggling to figure out which of the millions of nonprofits to actually give your money to, then I suggest you check out GiveWell. GiveWell is an organization that was specifically founded to do research and analysis on charitable organizations with the goal of helping us find the highest impact options available. And by being super efficient, GiveWell donations will so far have saved up to 150,000 lives. 
They pick charities like, for example, the Malaria Consortium, which helps to get medicine to kids who need it. With over 600,000 people being killed by malaria yearly, it's a very serious issue, but it only costs about $7 to protect the child from it with the Malaria Consortium. Or another organization is Helen Keller International, who helps prevent vitamin A deficiencies that over 200,000 people die from yearly. It only costs $1 to deliver vitamin A supplements to someone who needs it, which leads to this being an extremely impactful way to help. You can find and read all of GiveWell's research and recommendations on their sites for free if you want to make up your own mind. They're based on their own research, independent studies, and the expertise of 39 staff researchers who have backgrounds in economics, biology, philosophy, and more, so you can rest assured that each recommendation is thoroughly selected and high impact. GiveWell doesn't take a cut on your donations, and in fact, if you've never donated to one of their charities before, they'll even match your donation up to $100 until the end of the year and until their donation matching fund lasts. So join the over 100,000 people who have used GiveWell before and make your year-end donations at givewell.org, pick YouTube, and then enter Friday Checkout at checkout to help make sure that I sent you and that they should match your donation because of that. Oh, and don't forget that the donation itself is even tax deductible in many countries if you follow their instructions. So again, it is givewell.org and Friday Checkout. Happy holidays, and I'll see you next Friday.